at the start of 2019, I talked about the agonizing tragedy that was Ari Aster's Hereditary, a film that got so deep under my skin that it left me so profoundly shaken in a way I have never felt before. Of course, for many that seemed like a hyperbolic claim, but Hereditary was far more than just a supernatural horror about a family gradually falling under the control of a demon-worshipping cult led by the family's recently deceased manipulative grandmother to resurrect the king of hell through the body of their son. I know that sounds pretty weird out of context. What Hereditary was truly about, subtextually and even more provocatively, was the breakdown of a relatable everyday family during overwhelmingly difficult times and confronting the deep inner hatred they, like so many of us, desperately try to repress. It was a dark, broodingly somber experience that never made you feel safe or welcome. It stripped away the safety, security and sanctuary we take for granted within the family home setting, leaving us exposed to the big, bad, ugly world while subsequently making those we depend on for reassurance and emotional support feel just as dangerous. While Hereditary will certainly resonate more powerfully with those from fractured families, there is no denying its realistic depiction of grief, its allegory for guilt, and how it seemingly challenges how unconditional love actually is. Hereditary had a palpable human drama at the centre of it all that wasn't afraid to confront how venomous and selfish we could truly be. And to bring this all thematically full circle, Ari Aster's follow-up film not only serves as a perfect companion piece, but also a necessary one that will hopefully bring you out of Hereditary's depressive pit of despair. So yeah, let's finally talk about it. As far as I'm concerned, Midsummer is a spiritual sequel to Hereditary, and given the year gap between both films and their distinctly contrasting mood, narrative and stylistic choices, it's very much possible Ari Aster always intended it this way. In fact, I'm probably not the only person to point this out. While Hereditary is a descent into our relationship with death, Midsummer is an ascension from it. That being, whereas Hereditary is about pain, Midsummer is about healing and despite how morbid it can be, it's one of those unorthodox examples of positive horror, you could say. Broadly speaking, Midsummer treats death as something we can control, not necessarily literally, although we will get to that, but as something we can control emotionally. Far too often, we think we can speak on behalf of others' experiences, whether it be on grief, depression, anxiety, stress, or well, anything negative in general that can bring us together as much as it can tear us apart, leading to some people throwing away compassion in favour of playing the cheer up card or some other one uppity passive aggressive I have it worse than you style comment as if it's a f***ing competition to find out who's the most miserable. I clearly have a lot of issues I need to work through. Midsummer aims to confront this obsession with wallowing in our misery, by telling the story of a grief-stricken girl called Danny, who goes on an enlightening trip to Sweden with her ignorant asshole boyfriend and his friends, only to discover something isn't right. Well, technically that isn't, strictly speaking, true, uh, but we'll come back to that. Midsummer pretty much lays all its cards immediately on the table through a mural that serves as a roadmap for the film, establishing the recurring theme of control that's prevalent in Hereditary, in that it is super transparent with the audience about how inevitable this outcome will be, while the characters remain completely oblivious to it. Carrying the cold, macabre tone of Hereditary, the opening sees Danny fearfully trying to contact her bipolar sister, who is tragically revealed to have committed a murder-suicide with her parents, spiralling Danny's life into total isolation as she has nobody left to love or care for her. Sure, we have her boyfriend Christian, but he's actually grown disinterested and insincere towards her, yet is too scared to end it, thus continuing a toxic, romantically disconnected relationship for the sake of his own selfish fears of being alone. 
This fear then manifests itself in the final act of the story when Danny is made May Queen and everybody pays attention to her, leaving Christian to succumb to the same emotional and existential alienation Danny was experiencing throughout the entire film. As Ari Aster bluntly described, Midsummer is a breakup movie, a very personal and nuanced one, if indeed with a darkly twisted sense of humour to it. What's interesting is that we never see Danny and Christian have some big theatrical argument or fall into the cliches of general breakup movies. Their tension is sustained through their lack of emotional or physical attachment to each other, specifically accentuated by the dismissive nature of Christian, who honestly does think he's caring but is ultimately ignorant to his own lack of genuine empathy for Danny. He is essentially the antagonist of the story, yet I don't think it's that he's so much heartless as he is just deeply unaware of his selfish behaviour and how it reflects on the people around him, much to the same extent as his friends who don't respect the community's culture because of two varying degrees of self-interest, one coldly examining them like test subjects for his research and the other uh, pissing on their sacred tree. Dude, is he gonna kill me? Danny and Christian's lack of communication only intensifies the issue. In fact, theoretically, it's Christian's own fault that he dies in the end because Danny chooses him as her May Queen sacrifice as a result of his inability to confront his true feelings. Communication is a prominent theme in both movies. When the characters actually talk, it progresses the story, and when they don't, it stalls them from becoming aware of the true danger that actually surrounds them. Going back to what I said earlier, the entire film rests on Danny's perception of reality. Her trauma, grief, guilt and absolute despair alienates her from the world, with the drug use scene reinforcing this visceral existential displacement that heightens her fears and anxieties. This is then mirrored when Christian is drugged in the final act, where his own fears and anxieties disconnect him from reality and make him feel the same sense of helplessness and powerlessness Danny has experienced throughout the story that he neglected. However, it is more literal in his regards because it eventually paralyzes him and becomes a sort of ritualistic punishment and humiliation where he is objectified for pure sexual purposes and then acts as a physical beacon of light for Danny to find solace as he's cocooned in the body of a bear for obvious symbolism and set alight. I don't think the film is totally explicit about Christian being exceedingly controlling, although the director's cut does add scenes to reinforce his already evident assholishness, but you could say it does work on the premise that we never truly know what their relationship was like behind closed doors. Hereditary literally opens us up to the intimate lives of the Graham family with its voyeuristic composition, symbolising Annie's models before later revealing that the family are actually being watched the entire time. Midsummer, on the other hand, isn't as open as its cultists will have you believe. They simply create the illusion of transparency, but in fact are only transparent with the audience as established in the very opening, meaning we as the audience take on the same voyeuristic observer role as as hereditary, thus making for a similar role-reversing perception when viewing the film for a second time. Watch my video on hereditary, I will explain that in greater detail. Okay, so where exactly is this all going, you may ask? Well, let's talk about the cult itself. Okay, for the record, I'm not going to explain the entire cultural backdrop because, well, the film literally explains all the folklore, beliefs, and rituals, and if you need a video to explain that to you, you clearly weren't watching the movie. Plus, there's already dozens of videos and articles out there, so I have nothing to add. Anyway, the cult here is surprisingly similar to Hereditary, in that, including the fact that they have the most bizarre creepy smiles and constantly stare at people from off screen, it's only the surface level smoke screen to what the film is truly focused on. The difference with this cult, however, is that while benefiting from genuine real life historical context and not supernatural stuff, don't actually have anything to hide. Okay, yeah, sure, they don't exactly disclose to their guests that they're destined to be barbecued, but but the point is, everything that they believe and do is entirely normal to them. 
One of the most harrowing scenes in the film is when two of the local elders throw themselves off a cliff as part of the cult's belief in Erestupa, where the elders have total and absolute control and dominance over their death. They see this as a positive, allowing the individual to prepare and accept death instead of natural circumstances that tragically affect everyone around them. Of course, the film isn't supportive on the logic as one elder survives and becomes a human high striker, which I felt was a way of demonstrating just how real everything is and grinding the otherworldly feel of their beliefs, no pun intended. Their beliefs are true to them, but they're still fallible. I mean, they get their prophecies from this kid after all. It makes Danny reflect on the death of her family. When we talk about control, Danny's comparison is negative because death is control through suicide in these cases, which is something that the elders clearly don't want given their nervous stares prior to the event. The fact is, no matter how much time you have, nobody is ever truly ready to accept death. It's even more bleak when the elders are effectively controlled by the beliefs of the cult, as this isn't honestly their choice, it's just something they've been told to believe. It's a philosophically complex area of sensitivity that's going to affect everyone in different ways. It calls upon issues like cancer or terminal diseases in general that have a long-standing effect until and even after death. When the cult burn the dead and willing, or well, partially willing sacrifices at the end, it's treated like a fairy tale like relief. The cult break down and unleash all their anguish, leaving them only with the contentment that we all strive for in life. Alternatively, it's actually somewhat hypocritical when they rebuke selfishness by more or less basing their beliefs around healing through the suffering of others, but I'll leave that to you in the comments below. But the point is, they prepare for the inevitable that we all face, and this is just their odd way of saying that pain and sadness are okay, so don't be afraid to let it all out. Yeah, I know, it's a less kid-friendly version of Inside Out, you could say. The cult become more than just some spectacular support group for Danny. They become the family she's always wanted and needed. They invite and encourage her with nothing but sincere intent. She becomes a symbol of why they trust a belief system and why people trust belief systems in general. It brings them happiness in times of pain and uncertainty. The film has a way of showing that it's fine to depend on others during hardship. You shouldn't suffer alone alone or be made to feel alone, reflected in her disconnection with Christian and his friends, brought to life in a genuinely haunting dream where she feels like she's being abandoned. The thing is, Midsummer does not rely so much on conventional symbolism, you could say. It contextualizes Danny's feelings around her experience as opposed to defining her experience by her feelings. What I mean by this is that the external circumstances around her, the people, the community, the events that transpire, are all influential to her journey instead of making the world feel like a subjective internal reflection of her emotions. It makes for a much more honest look at the world. A world that begins as hostile and bleak, yet as Danny becomes accustomed and encouraged by those who see the brighter side in life, suddenly the world begins to feel a lot less scary. While Midsummer is definitely a horror movie, I like to see it as an epilogue to fear, in the same way the first half of Hereditary is a prologue to it. By the end, Midsummer comes to a peaceful resolution that is rarely seen in horror movies, where we know for a fact that Danny is safe from the evils that brought her down to begin with, death be damned. Because at the end of the day, what truly matters to her is finding the happiness she's been sorely missing. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for your patience because this is literally the most requested video I have ever gotten since the film has released and now I'm only finally getting round to it. I talked about Hereditary 11 months ago back in January, it was the film that started this year off and it seems only appropriate that I somewhat conclude the year with uh, Midsummer as a kind of a, a collective companion uh, piece as I said at the beginning, although we still 
still have some videos left to come before uh, 2019 comes to an end. So if you want to get early access to them, you want to get your name in the credits for those videos, and you want to get access to our exclusive Discord chat and even vote on what could be the video of your choice in 2020, uh, consider heading over to my Patreon and supporting me there. And until next time, uh, stay very, very safe going into the holiday season. And yeah, uh, don't join any cults. I'll see you all very soon. Bye.